Welcome to the show that gets Christians thinking about faith and politics. Get ready to challenge the status quo, expand your imagination, and tackle controversy head on. Let's stand together at the intersection of faith and freedom. It's time for the Libertarian Christian Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Libertarian Christian Podcast, a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute and part of the Christians for Liberty Network. I'm your host, Doug Stewart, and my guest today is Alex Narasta, who is the Director of Economic and Social Policy Studies at the Cato Institute. His popular publications have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, the Washington Post, and most other major publications in the U.S. He's here to talk to us today about nationalism and open immigration. Alex, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm excited to talk to you. And initially, when I had your name on my radar, it was all about immigration. And then I noticed that you debated Rich Lowry from the National Review recently at the Soho Forum, and you talked about nationalism. And I found your, I want to say defense against it, but I guess it's the opposite, but your offense against it to be quite appealing. So I want to talk to you about both of these topics, simply because they are in a lot of ways intertwined in certain ways. What's a little bit of the backstory on that? I mean, when I think of your name out there, I think immigration policy stuff. And to see your name up on the nationalism, I was like, oh, well, that's kind of interesting. How did that get arranged for you to be the the guy defending against Rich Lowry on that? I've been following nationalism for some time. A lot of the big anti-immigration folks I've debated over the years are self-described nationalists. And Mm. until Trump came along, I didn't really take that seriously because I thought nationalism was just this sort of poorly thought out proto-ideology. And so I just didn't give much attention to the nationalism espoused by some of these nativists. But then when Donald Trump won the nomination for the GOP candidate in 2016, and then all these nationalist politicians were being elected in Europe, I decided to devote some attention to it as a potential explanation for nativism, sort of an ideology in the background that supports these anti-immigration opinions. So I decided to read a lot about it, a lot of pro-nationalist books by folks like Yoram Hazoni, and then, of course, Rich Lowry's book that came out in 2019, as well as a lot of academic literature on the topic, and wrote up a few blog posts over the years about it, and wrote a book review of Rich's book. And then I consistently sort of hammered nationalism on Twitter, somewhat jokingly Mm. at times, but also seriously at times. And there haven't been a lot of coherent critics of nationalism, unfortunately. It just is a word that inspires a lot of emotional reaction. And I tried to think through it. So I think being one of the handful of critics who didn't come at it from a sort of like emotional knee-jerk opposition, I think rose me to being the person they selected to debate Rich on this topic. Yeah, well, and one of the pillars of your argument was that it has turned out horribly in history, even if it's supposedly was benign and just supposed to be uniting. Like, it just has always kind of played out very poorly. That's right. One of the ways that I viewed it is also sort of like the right-wing version of communism, right? Like this poorly thought-out utopianism, where there might be some good intentions there, But in practice, the outcome and the effects are terrible, especially from the perspective of libertarians or maybe traditional conservatives. So, you know, not every nationalist country engages or starts a world war or commits genocide or creates a very large, all-encompassing state that centrally plans the economics and culture of the countries that they govern. But that is a frequent outcome of nationalist governments. And I think that we should treat nationalism in the same way that we treat communism, which is sort of reflexive opposition and skepticism, unless there is an extremely large amount of evidence to the contrary. Yeah. So everybody's going to have their own definition of nationalism. Rich Lowry had his. I've recently read a book or two on the topic where it's described a certain way. How is it that you define nationalism? Because, of course, it's important for us to know what you're standing up against. So it's a ideology of group rights. It is not an ideology of individual rights. It is basically an ideology that says, my group best or my tribe best, your tribe bad. And it is wound up in ethnic identification, ethnic politics as Mm -hmm. the 
political scientist as our GAD, who's a scholar of nationalism, finds. And that's important to go back to what the word means. Rich Lowry, in his book, spends a lot of time defending the word nationalism. Yoram Hazoni defends the word nationalism. They spend many, many pages separating nationalism from patriotism. Well, the Latin root of the word nationalism is natio, which means ethnicity, tribe, race, a identity ascribed to you by birth, by feature of your ethnicity. That is how it is understood in Europe and much of the world as being an ideology mm -hmm. of governance for one particular ethnic or tribal group against other ethnic or tribal groups that are within that country or could seek to create a state. And that is something that I think is very alien to the American experience of governance. This country, when it was founded, 60% of the population was from the British Isles. But that includes, of course, Scots and Welsh, English and Irish, who are different ethnicities and, of course, have different ideas about nationalism. Mm. But then on top of that, you have about 20 percent of the population from different European countries like Germans, Swedes, French, Dutch, for instance, that are different ethnicities. And then on top of that, 20 percent of the population or so that were black African slaves and their descendants, as well as different American Indian tribes who are living there. So the notion that the United States is a nation as it is traditionally defined is just ludicrous. The founding fathers could not have created a nation if they wanted to, given this ethnically diverse country at the time of the founding, and certainly can't create one today. Now, they absolutely created a country. They created a new state. They created a new government. But they did not create a nation state in any meaningful sense in the way that the word is actually defined, which is really weird for Americans to hear, right? Like, I've yeah. always thought until relatively recently that the word nation was just like a synonym for country or was a synonym for like the state, for instance, that governs that country. Right, right. And that's the way that Americans view it. So when I heard Americans starting to talk about nation state, I'm like, why would you use that redundant phrase? Mm. Like, that's just like a weird. But when you go to Europe and you talk to Europeans, and I've lived in England for a bit, uh, to do my graduate degree, it just has a very different meaning there. And that meaning is that it is a nation that represents a particular traditional ethnic group in that country. So the Hungarian nation represents Hungarians, which are like a particular ethnic group that are the majority of people in that country. There are other ethnic groups in there like Roma and others, which are gypsies traditionally, and others. But the state is meant to represent the interests of the majority ethnic population. And that's basically it. So it's a weird, to my eyes, as somebody who's steeped in classical liberalism and enlightenment traditions, that value individualism, right? This nationalism is a very different ideology that emphasizes the group, group rights, which sounds like a contradiction, maybe group powers is better, and the power of a government to represent that majority ethnic group rather than an ideology of individual rights and freedom. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting that the very first thing you said is an ideology of group rights and any libertarian or even conservative who's been paying attention is noticed that on the ultra left, that is literally all that we've been hammered into us over the past five to 10 years is that we need to start identifying people by their ethnicities and we need to acknowledge it and give deference to it. And like, it basically is sort of a pillar of the woke left. Do you see that connection as well? I mean, do you see that they're just basically the, uh, I would say polar opposites, but like the mirrors of each other? It's sort of horseshoe theory in action, right? You mm. have this sort of extremes okay, yeah. on both sides that are somewhat gravitating to the same kind of explicit ethnic-based governance mode. Now, I'll say this. Rich, in his book and his debate, rejects that. He thinks that nationalism is sort of a cultural identity rather than an ethnic one. Of course, he spends much of the time in his book quoting favorably supporters of nationalism from their books, like Anthony Smith. Mm -hmm. You know, the title of his book is The Ethnic Origin of Nations. It's about ethnicity. It's about that. And throughout most of human history, culture and ethnicity are closely correlated, which makes a lot of sense. That's obvious. Now, in a lot of places, though, like the United States, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, some of these very successful countries that are offshoots of the British Empire, 
that are colonies at one time that were settled by immigrants from many different places, that correlation breaks down substantially. So, I mean, just to give a personal anecdote, I don't like using anecdotes because I'm a data guy, but I think an anecdote helps here. My father's side of the family is all Iranian. They came over from Iran in the 40s and 60s and 70s. My mother's side is all Americans from Western Europe, uh, white Europeans from Western Europe who came over at different times in America's past. And I have basically zero connection to anything Iranian. I don't speak Farsi. I've never been to Iran. I'm not a Muslim. I don't even like Persian food that much, right? Like there's (laughs) basically no connection I have with that. I'm culturally much more similar to somebody in Western Europe than I am to anything in Iran, except for maybe the way that I look and my funny spelled last name. And I'm not unique. That's not weird. There are 100 million people in the United States like that. And my kids are like that. My wife is like that. All right. And all of our neighbors are like that. So I just don't think however useful the sort of relationship is between ethnicity and culture throughout the broad strokes of human history may be in the United States currently and in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and several other countries, it is not that useful of a method to describe one's citizenship or member yeah, right. in a country, best citizenship in a country. So I think a lot of people could understand that your concern about using the word nationalism to refer back to natio, meaning ethnicity or tribe or race, is maybe an antiquated way of sort of gathering and, you know, at least if you're not a leftist, is antiquated in the sense that it's not necessary anymore for us to share that in order for us to be a nation or in order for us to be a country. And so in some ways, I grew up thinking that to be an American... Yes, I had the same confusion you did about nation and state and government and all that, which is pretty common. But that to be an American means that you believe in individual rights. And so there is the sort of libertarian, classical liberal founding father ethos that that's what it means to be an American. Why can't we just make our nationalism, I'm using air quotes here, around that and call it, well, it's nationalism, but it's very libertarian because it's actually going to be secular in one sense. So if one wanted to have nationalist-type feelings about the United States in that way, that would be broadly okay with me, and that would be fine. But then it's like, well, that's also patriotism, right? (laughs) which I think more is a better word to describe that, and doesn't have all the negative connotations and the baggage involved with that. It sort of reminds me of people I know who are left-wingers who call themselves socialists, but then you ask them, do you want the government to own all the means of production in the United States? And they say, oh, no, no, no. What they really mean is they just want a large welfare state. And then my next question, well, why do you call yourself a socialist then? Like, why do you care? want to carry on this baggage of central planning and whatnot? And they're like, oh, well, the word has changed. And I'm like, well, it hasn't changed for the vast majority of people or, you know, around the world or in the United States, right? So... uh, I'm not one of these people who think that like words don't ever change. Obviously, they do change. Our language is a spontaneous order that evolves Mm -hmm. over time. But we haven't evolved the word nationalism to mean something like sort of more patriotism or more patriotic or jingoism or something like that yet. It still means, in a lot of people's minds, something very bad and is associated with some of the worst regimes of the 20th century and even Mm -hmm. before that. So... If you wanted to say, like, we should have a patriotic movement in this country that emphasizes some shared cultural characteristics as well as an affinity for the founding fathers, individual rights, saying the Constitution is a legitimate document, that would be fine. But then why do you want to have the baggage of this really, really bad word, Mm -hmm. which is correlated with so many atrocities in so many places? Why not just choose patriotism? Yeah. Well, that makes sense. I mean... There is a pride of place that I think one could have legitimately in that, like, I'm proud to be an American because I love the people around me and I love the values that I believe that America aspires to be. But that's not nationalism, right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, I love, I consider myself to be a very patriotic person. I love the United States. I'm happy that I was fortunate enough to be born in this country. I love it so much that I wanted to grow in terms of inviting many millions of immigrants to come to this country and to be here. But that is 
very distinct from nationalism. And nationalists think it's distinct too. Yoram Hazoni and Rich Lowry and all these other nationalists go out of their way to distinguish my pie into patriotism from nationalism. And they distinguish it for important ideological reasons to support their nationalist program. But then they try to have it both ways sometimes and say, oh, no, nationalism doesn't mean all this other stuff. It basically means like more patriotism. And I'm like, well, I don't believe you because they go back and forth on this based on the audience and whether they're losing a debate or not. So I think there's definitely more to it there than just a sort of uber patriotism. If the nationalists are actually convincing more and more people that nationalism is good, what is it that they're actually accomplishing? Because it seems to me, I mean, my picture in my mind of what nationalism looks like is probably very shaded by the mainstream media, which is basically a lot of sort of mostly Southern white folk hoping to take America back for Jesus or get our country back to the founding fathers or whatever. And it's very, and I can understand why somebody on the left might say, oh, that's not the kind of nationalism we're talking about. We're against it and all of that. I don't know if the Lowry's and the Hazonis of the world are saying, well, we need to make it about ethnicity, but that is sort of where it goes. But what are they accomplishing? Are they just winning hearts and and minds to people to love America? Because again, that now we're back to that distinction between patriotism and nationalism. So I'm a believer in the very simple model of left versus right that Brian Kaplan came up with. And it describes, I think, about 80% of the difference. And the simple model is that about 80% of modern left-wingers, they're broadly anti-market or very skeptical of markets. And they believe in equality even to like absurd degrees. And then I think you can explain about 80% of right-wingers by saying they're just anti-left-wingers. There's not really an ideology (laughs) there. And left-wingers do have an ideology. That doesn't mean it's better, right? Like, I I think the left-wing ideology is like very destructive. The policy to freedom, to capitalism, to everything. But I think that there is that feature. And you see this when you talk to left-wingers or right-wingers, right? I can talk to my left-wing friends all day about their ideas. And they never mention conservatives once. Like once. They might, but it's not common. Yeah. I talk to my right-wing friends about what they believe, and within five seconds, it's left-wingers this, left-wingers that, right? It's just like an oppositional or, you know, reactionary. They frame their position as being not left-wing. Yeah, it's a reactionary mindset. And that's valuable and fine. doesn't mean that they're wrong. Because there's lots to react against on the left that's very bad. But there's also this portion of the right that's uncomfortable with that. And they're trying to find an ideology that is universal and not specific to time and place that left-wingers do have. So I think we see this in the multiple evolutions of the right that have occurred just in my lifespan. So like prior to 9-11 in the 90s, there was this moral majority stuff about a lot of ethics and, you know, Christian-inspired ethics in public policy. Then after 9-11, for about eight or 10 years, it was, we need to go to war all the time to defend America against this urgent threat. And then from about 2008, 2010 to like 2015, they're pretending to be libertarians and to say that free markets are all that matters. And then around the time of Trump, it became this sort of like Trumpism, which is basically like a proto, it started as like a proto cult of personality and grew into that. But the really smart right wingers, people like Rich Lowry, I think were uncomfortable with that. And they wanted to find this ideological thread Mm. in modern conservatism to say, no, this is what it really is. It really is nationalism. And that's what I think they were sort of attracted to in this sphere. And I also think that in the next five years, we're going to see a transformation of American conservatives to something else, some other thing that they think is, no, this is the real thing that we believe in. This is the ideological underpinning. Just don't expect them to acknowledge any of the other ideological Mm, movements that have inspired American conservatives over the years. So there's this deep, unsettling feeling amongst a lot of right-wingers that they're just reactionary. They're just unsettled. And amongst really really smart right-wingers, They want something more than that, and they're constantly casting about. You can probably basically follow Saurabh Amari's intellectual evolution over the years to track this pretty closely. (laughs) So in what capacity or in what sense do you think Americans can rightly sort of group identify together as Americans? And I'm going to ask that and lead to the next question so it makes sense a little bit more. Because, okay, fine, we can't call ourselves a nation proper, right? But People like Japan, Iceland, many countries around the world can do that. 
and they can identify as like Alex, you could have grown up in Iran, right? And you could be very attached to being Iranian in that world. And like, is it immoral or unethical or is it wrong for these people groups or nations or nation states or however we want to call it to want to be Icelandic, Japanese, Iranian, and sort of have their own self-determination is a word that's commonly used. Why wouldn't they have that right? And then if they do or if they don't, you can answer that. Why not have that in America, even if it's not about ethnicity? So I don't necessarily think it's like obviously wrong. I just think it has enormous costs. So this is one of the things that I, I can see it up front when I debate nationalists is I do think the nationalism and this sort of ethnic attachment is something that is hardwired into a lot of human nature. I do think it's natural. I think there's a good reasons to expect this to evolve in humans who grew up in small tribes and ethnic groupings right. for hundreds of thousands of years, right, before the modern world. So I expect that. In the same way that I think sort of a primitive egalitarianism is pretty natural amongst humans. I think a desire to have a strong man leader in charge of a tribe is pretty natural. I think the desire to try to find causality between sort of um, naturally occurring events and the intervention of a deity is also pretty natural. But I think that humans thrive when we suppress or channel those feelings into other avenues outside of power, right? I think we thrive when we take our primitive egalitarianism and we sort of relegate that to charity and we relegate that to private transactions and when we separate that from the state. We embrace market economics, we thrive. When we embrace sort of a primitive egalitarian form of economic exchange, we don't do so well. When we sort of embrace the scientific method as a way to understanding the world and crush this sort of primitive religion-inspired explanation for natural phenomenon, we do better. And the same thing for nationalism. When we reduce our nationalist instincts or channel them into non-state actions, like maybe ethnic affinity organizations or who you decide to marry or what kind <laughs> of food you like or who you want to associate with on a private voluntary basis, I think that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But as soon as you get the government involved in these types of decisions, I think you are limiting human potential dramatically. You are making it so that humans don't do nearly as well materially, spiritually, in terms of respecting individual freedoms. And this may be because I come at libertarianism more from a consequentialist perspective than others that I'm viewing this. But if you're going to live in a country that embraces nationalism and this idea of sort of ethnic, a government that supports a particular ethnic group, there are going to be extreme costs that are very high that are borne by that. And some people may think that's worth it. I don't think that's worth it. And I would say for most countries that want to develop economically and respect individual rights, it's much harder to get there with a nationalist ethos and a nationalist government than it is if you channel those feelings into other areas. So I guess it's a roundabout way of saying, yes, I think it's wrong, but it's a very hard thing to reduce. And in the United States, we've done a great job of doing this. You know, our constitution, it sure isn't perfect, but it's done a pretty good job, I think, over the years of trying to break down a lot of these barriers until relatively recently mm -hmm. with yeah. wokeism and all that. So it sounds like what the major problem with all that natural instinct that you just described is that the state is involved because your nationalism has to, by definition, be, at least at this stage in history, involving the state in order to maintain it. Absolutely. Like most things, when the state gets involved, it really ruins them. So, like, for instance, I'm not a religious person, but religion does an enormous amount of good for most people in the world today mm -hmm. and has done so historically. But when the government gets involved with enforcing a particular religion, like in Iran, for instance, when it became a theocracy, I think that has done enormous harm to that society, enormous harm to people who don't want to participate in the Islamic government and want to be Shia Muslims. And it's done enormous harm, I think, to Shia Islam by making it much less appealing to people. I mean, one of the big findings by Larry Iannacone, who's an economist who studies religion, is that countries where there is a free market of religion like the United States, or at least pretty free, 
in that you have more religious belief, more religious devotion. You have people who are interested in it more rather than in a country like Sweden, where the Church of Sweden was a literal government agency until recently. It was unadaptive to the spiritual demands of the population, didn't change. Well, in the United States, you have a proliferation of Christian sects that have been founded over the years that met the spiritual demands of their congregants. If I were a militant atheist who wanted to make sure that Americans became as atheistic as possible, I would want a church supported by the state because I know <laughs> that they would ruin it in some way and make it totally unappealing to the vast majority of Americans. <laughs> Interesting. Hi, this is Gregory Baus. And this is Carrie Baldwin. If you're enjoying this podcast, you may want to check out the other shows in the Christians for Liberty Network, such as the Reformed Libertarians podcast, hosted by me and Carrie. We educate and inspire listeners to embrace and promote libertarianism as grounded in the Reformed faith. The Christians for Liberty Network is dedicated to offering a variety of content you love, like what you're hearing in this very episode. So now back to the show, and then be sure to check out reformedlibertarians.com. So I have one before we pivot to immigration a little bit. I have a question that I know a lot of people are very concerned about right now. And this is one of the pillars that he may not have spoken about it more specifically, but it was Donald Trump and that Donald Trump spoke about more specifically, which is globalism. And I think on the one hand, I would agree, of course, with you that individual rights and individual freedom is a bulwark against a nationalism that is dangerous. But then you've got something on the other side of that spectrum, which is the global aspect of it, or the, I don't want to call it a globalist agenda because it sounds too conspiratorial, but there are people who are globalists. And there are organizations that are like the United Nations that are global organizations and other institutions that want America to be beholden to things that are not in favor of individual liberty. And I think a lot of conservatives see nationalism as a bulwark against globalists who don't want America to maintain those distinctives that you and I both rightly appreciate. So if they mean by globalism, global government, if they mean sort of the control over the U.S. government by international agencies or other governments, then I'm a skeptic of globalism too. But if they mean that they're opposed to things like the WTO, which is an international group of members who voluntarily join and sign a treaty to try to limit trade barriers and to have freer trade between countries, that's not really the same thing, right? That's an organization that the United States government voluntarily signs up for and can leave at any time. There are consequences of doing so, which would be that other governments would raise tariffs on the United States. So I don't want to say it's without consequences of leaving, but it is an organization that does increase the individual rights of Americans to trade with people in other countries with fewer trade barriers. So that kind of thing, I don't see in the same way. But if you want to say like the United Nations getting involved and, you know, at some point potentially writing environmental rules that then Americans individually have to follow that limits their individual freedom, that is something that I oppose and that would be bad. But I got to, you know, if the United States signed a treaty that said, you know, we're going to respect the rights of Americans to keep and bear arms like we have traditionally, and we expect other countries to do the same thing in their countries. If some like, you know, WTO style organization that respected individual gun rights existed, I would see that as an individual liberty enhancing type of international agreement. So it all depends on the type of agreement as far as I see it. So mm -hmm. the United States government voluntarily limiting its own power to infringe upon the rights of Americans by signing an international agreement. OK, that sounds great to me as somebody who's concerned about state power. But. The problem is there are all these other international agreements that True. limit the individual liberty of Americans. So it's, you know, the devil's in the details and the devil is in these different types of organizations and what they seek to accomplish. What do you make of people's impulse to elect somebody like Trump who promises to stand up against such threats? Real or imagined? <laughs> Real or imagined. What do I make of that? I want to try to listen to what their individual complaints actually are. So if their individual complaints are those that I described of they're upset about the United Nations or they're upset about this or that, trying to influence their rights, I understand that. And then I want to ask for specifics, like how real is this threat? 
Is it a real threat? Most of the time, it's not really a real threat or it's grossly exaggerated. But usually when I talk to them, they're against things like NAFTA, which was a treaty that limited trade restrictions between the US, Canada, and Mexico. And I'm like, okay, so your main criticism is that the US government doesn't have as much power to tax American consumers of foreign <laughs> goods as much as they had before. And I just have no, no interest in that. What they mean yeah. by globalism is something just, they just don't like foreigners and they don't want Americans to be able to trade or interact with them freely. And I just, I don't, I view that in the same way that I view a labor union that argues against trade because it might hurt some American workers somewhere. I just don't give it much attention because what they ultimately want is to restrict the freedom of Americans to deal with foreigners in the way that they want. Well, that seems to lead right into the next topic, which we're going to spend a little less time on, which is immigration. I mean, I've done several episodes on this. So I've spoken with Jason Brennan, Art Cardin, Brian Kaplan. I mean, you're among friends there in, in your perspective, of course, on, on open immigration. And, you know, I've promoted this as well. But it just seems to me such a blindingly obvious benefit to, I wouldn't say all involved, because there, of course, there are individuals who are harmed by immigration. But there is a growing alarmism or a growing threat over the last decade that immigrants are, we can deal with the fact that people are overselling it, right? They're taking over the country or they're more violent. And there's all these myths that you've got a book out there that's, I think it's a free ebook on Cato.org about the myths about immigration. But at the end of the day, I just, I always have to ask like, why are people still against this? This just doesn't, it seems anti-American to me to be that against immigration. One of the big reasons nowadays is the chaos involved with immigration and the perceptions of chaos along the border. So one common finding in political science is that when people think something is chaotic, they are reflexively against that thing. So when people see the chaos at the southwest border, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of apprehensions a year of illegal immigrants, they lump in that chaos with legal immigration. Now, you and I know that chaos is caused by immigration restrictions, making it impossible for people to come to this country, but people don't separate that out. So I do think a large percentage of the opposition is due to this chaos that is created by our immigration system along the southwest border, which creates this horrible catch-22. Because the only way to liberalize immigration is to have a system that's not chaotic, but the only way to get a non-chaotic system is to liberalize. So you got this like horrible catch-22 <laughs> that makes it very difficult, right? And I like to think like if I lived in a major city, right, in an urban area with a lot of crime and people dealing drugs on my street and the violence associated with that, I think I would be reflexively separating out the non-libertarian part of my brain would be reflexively opposed to drugs, including drug legalization, because I would see this chaos and I'd be like, well, drugs are bad, so I definitely don't want to li liberalize it. Now, the libertarian rational part of my brain says, well, this chaos is caused by the restrictions. So if we legalized it, people wouldn't be shooting themselves or shooting each other over drug deals. They would just go down to 7-Eleven and buy the drugs they want and go home and it'd be as violent as alcohol or tobacco consumption, right? But I do think that most people don't think about it that way. And so if you reduce the chaos along the U.S. border down to, you say, 99% lower than what it is currently, I think support for liberalizing immigration would be substantially greater. And if all these people who are coming in illegally were instead to be able to come in lawfully through an orderly system where you don't have shocking images of chaos or people scaling a border wall and people getting apprehended, I think you have support for much more liberalized immigration, not free immigration along the lines that I want, right? But an immigration system that's three to five times higher in terms of annual admissions to the United States, a substantial difference from where it is right now. Now, going from that standpoint to say a free immigration system, I think you run into other criticisms of culture, of economics, of crime, of these types of things that I talk about. But I think this big hurdle, this big marginal jump from where we are now up to, say, three to five, six million people a year, that is reflexively caused by just the perceptions of chaos and the chaos along the border. And if we could get control of that, I think it is a far better debate for my side, for our side. Yeah. Why wouldn't conservatives be more willing to see that this is caused by the state? I mean, 
it seems to me that even conservatives nowadays are more open to at least legalizing marijuana and maybe even other drugs. But like this still doesn't quite seem to be appealing prospect for them to liberalize immigration by blaming prohibition and the drug war and all those kinds of things along the border on the state itself. So I'm not sure that conservatives support liberalizing marijuana laws because they want to reduce chaos. I think there might be some other reasons why they're there. And I think there's a perception that most of the problems in the war of drugs, most of the violence and chaos is caused by drugs other than marijuana, right? It's caused by opioids, heroin, cocaine, meth, other more serious drugs. And I think there's just been this realization that you know, marijuana is not the problem. So if you had this realization that, you know, just hypothetically, if conservatives thought that, well, you know, the problem with immigration is not Mexicans or Central Americans, but it's some other distant group of immigrants from far away, then I think you could see them being like, yeah, we should let in more Mexicans. I could see Mm. that type of evolution, but that just hasn't happened in immigration because they sort of lump them all together with the chaos that's occurring along the Southwest border. Okay. And Maybe we can just blame the Russians and then they'll like more Mexicans. Can we do it that way? Yeah, perhaps. <laughs> I mean, that's a pretty cynical take, right? But maybe somebody who's oh. better at politics could um, figure out how to do that. People who are like, <laughs> oh, we don't like Chinese immigrants, so we're going to let in more Mexicans. But unfortunately, I think Americans, you know, we do typically rate like different foreigners as better than other foreigners based on the country they're from. We do do that. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure the distinction is like great enough for us to build these types of lines. So like during the Trump administration, they were very opposed to like Muslim immigration to the United States. There was the basis for many bans on immigrants from certain Muslim majority countries around the world, as well as people from other countries. But I'm just not sure if we're at that point where people are making relevant political distinctions between immigrants from different countries to the point where it would show up in policy. Now, I will say the Biden administration, beginning in January of 2023, has substantially liberalized legal immigration for Venezuelans, Cubans, Nicaraguans, and Haitians in an attempt to get control over the border. They basically can apply from their home countries, 30,000 of them a month, have to have an American sponsor, and they can come in and work right away and have no recourse to welfare. So it's like a great experiment. And I think, and what we've seen so far with the numbers in January is the number of people coming from those countries showing up at the border is down dramatically. So what I've been trying to do is talk to members of the administration and people in the U.S. government and say, hey, this chaos is a political killer for you. You know it's a political killer for you. You've tried the enforcement stuff. You've tried extra border patrol and walls and Title 42 and asylum restrictions try this liberalization, see the numbers come down, and then extend it to other countries. And this will give you that political win that you're looking for while also liberalizing immigration. And then you can move on to doing other things that you actually want to do rather than having a bunch of meaningless press conferences about how you're really concerned about the border and you're going to give Border Patrol more money. Like, you can do other things (laughs) now once you get control over this. That seems like they're trying to court conservatives by saying that kind of thing. Like, you're using the word chaos here, which I think is really a key term. By reducing chaos, you eliminate the bias or the reflexive reaction to it. And that I would say that that's probably a good approach. I mean, we could even end with an administration that said the border is less chaotic now that I'm leaving the border less chaotic. Oh, it'd be great for public policy in the United States. It'd be great for increasing public order and perceptions of order, and it'd be great for immigration. So I wrote a sub stack on this, but I do think that as libertarians, we have not focused on the reforms that will reduce the chaos and perceptions of chaos. Because if we like tomorrow did some kind of massive liberalization that we supported, and it led to a mass increase in chaos, then I think that that liberalization would be politically undermined and would be tenuous and would Mm -hmm. probably be reversed. But I want long-term permanent reductions in the power of the state over American or over individual lives in the United States. And then we have to think about how to do that, how to get those liberalizations in a way that they are sustainable also from a political perspective and that they reduce chaos, they reduce it immediately, they reduce it perceptively, they reduce it sustainably, 
And so that we don't give an argument to people on the other side that, hey, this isn't working too well. We need to crack down again, right? Like I think the legalization of marijuana in California is a prime example of like how not to do it because a big black market was sustained thereafter, partly because of really high taxes on marijuana that made illegal marijuana Mm -hmm. actually market competitive and the slow rollout of licenses for marijuana dispensaries in the state. So they could have crushed a black market on day one by saying, we're not going to give out licenses or the licenses are super easy to get. They're like 20 bucks. Yeah. You know, you fill out like a one or a half page form, you get a license and the taxes are either non-existent or so low that there's no way that black market marijuana could possibly compete with this. Then that would be really good. Um, but then on the other token, what you've seen since an increase in marijuana legalization is an increase in the smuggling of other harder drugs that has caused an increase in perceptions of chaos. So part of the other challenge is, okay, well, how does legalizing marijuana interact with not legalizing these other harder drugs? Because these black market networks exist, cartels exist. Mm-hmm. If they are shut out of one market, they're going to move into another market. So we've got to legalize as many of these markets as possible, as rapidly as possible to shrink the size of the black market and not give cartels time to adapt their criminal activities to move into other violent areas. Now, there's always going to be things that are illegal, right? Like extorting businesses for protection money is going to be illegal, even if all drugs and all the things that you and I want to do are legalized. And that is a role for law enforcement to reduce that, I think, and a legitimate role and function of the state. But the chaos that's going to be caused by that is going to be so substantially less than the chaos that is destroyed by legalizing drugs that we need to do it. But that's why I wish that some state somewhere had legalized not just marijuana, but also all these other drugs at roughly the same time and created a very liberal licensing regime for selling them and taxes that are so low that black market drug sales become uneconomical. Hmm. Wonder what state that could be. You know, fly up to New Oregon, Hampshire probably. and convince all of them. Yeah, maybe Oregon. Yeah, Colorado, maybe. Yeah. All right. I have one more question here. And One of the arguments against immigration is that we're kind of all full, right? It was good for our history to get a lot of immigrants in. And now that we've sort of stabilized and settled that we really should take a breather. I think it's Mark Krikorian's view. It's like, well, we need to take a breather and sort of think more strategically about who we let in because we have, I don't know, I don't know all the particular reasons. What do you make of that view? And would there ever be a point in your mind that we could say, okay, now it's time to take a breather? So I think the market economy is best at determining that than, than, than anything else. That that's what your answer would be. <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty, you know, you know, I'm a libertarian, right? You could probably just throw in the libertarian boilerplate about markets being the best determinant of this. But it's also, it's true, right? I mean, if wages from the United States are lower or about the same in other countries, then immigrants don't want to come here anymore. Or very many fewer will. It will be only the ones who want to live in the United States because they like our culture or some other aesthetic Uh, reasons to come here. So just from like a population density point of view, the United States is far less dense than rich countries in Western Europe and rich countries in Asia. We could let in literally billions of immigrants before we got to the point where the population would be as dense as these places. But even if it were denser than Western European countries, like, so what? What determines whether immigrants are willing to move here is their increase in real wages adjusted for the cost of living, And the wage differences for the median migrant from the developing world to the United States is a 4.1 fold increase in their wages. That is dramatic. That is vast, vast increase in wages. Mm -hmm. So the number of immigrants who would have to come here before those wages would equalize between the developing world and the United States is a very, very large amount, assuming, you know, all else being equal. And all else isn't equal, of course, but there would have to be a lot. And ultimately, the the organization, not our organization, but the mechanism that would determine whether there are too many immigrants in the United States or we're reaching that limit is going to be the market. It's not going to be politicians. It's not going to be bureaucrats. It's not going to be people like Mark Corian who are want to be central planners of the population. It's going to be the market. And it cannot be the government due to bad incentives that the government faces, due to knowledge problems that the government faces, due to economic calculation problems that the government faces. They are not the organization that is well-equipped to be able to determine that. There is no organization that can. It is a decentralized, unplanned market process that determines how many immigrants are most efficient to have in the United States. 
All right. Well, I appreciate all of your answers and the conversation that we've had, Alex. Where can people find you online and to get some of the resources that I know they're out there? So the best place to go is cato.org. That's C-A-T-O dot org. And we have a section on there about immigration. We can read all the work by myself, my colleague David Beer, and others on this topic. And if you want to follow me specifically, you can follow uh, at Alex Narasta on Twitter. That's at A-L-E-X-N-O-W-R-A-S-T-E-H on Twitter. Excellent. Well, thank you for joining me, Alex. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Libertarian Christian Podcast. If you liked today's episode, we encourage you to rate us on Apple Podcasts to help expand our audience. If you want to reach out to us, email us at podcast at libertarianchristians.com. You can also reach us at LCI Official on Twitter. And of course, we are on Facebook and have an active group you are welcome to join. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Libertarian Christian Podcast is a project of the Libertarian Christian Institute, a registered 501c3 nonprofit. If you'd like to find out more about LCI, visit us on the web at libertarianchristians.com. The voiceovers are by Matt Bellis and Catherine Williams. As of episode 115, our audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.